All right, welcome everybody to another product spotlight. Can you believe it's been another week? Folks, we are on one year this week, 52 weeks of streaming live offsite construction interviews from people all around the world and also from the United States. And today is no different. We have not missed a single day, six days a week for a full year. So we are celebrating that. It's exciting. We're making changes. We're growing our industry and we're bringing you the best and the brightest. So today is no different. We're going to have Rick Murdoch on our show from Autoval. And we are going to have a real discussion about the industry, how Autoval came to be, why Autoval is to be. And you know what? Where we're headed as an industry, and we're going to just start defining some terminology and just have some fun like we always do on this show. So if you're just tuning in, we are live on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. And we go to Twitch because that's where the young folks are. They surely are not coming to us. So let's make sure we go to them. All right. But before we get too far into it, we want to thank our sponsors. We love our sponsors and we really appreciate them. Ben Hershey, Joe Butler, Forward Solutions Group. They are a team of more than 175 years of experience developing and specifying manufacturing for panelized and volumetric modular industries with best practices in development and implementation. They offer consulting with investors, developers, manufacturers, and builders in using offsite manufacturing methods. Forward Solutions is driving companies to succeed where others have failed, and it is very true. Two of the nicest people you ever meet and also two of the smartest when it comes to our industry. To learn more, reach out to Ben at forwardsolutionsgroup.com. Joe and Ben, thank you. And another big announcement, we have another sponsor that, that we think is a perfect fit for our show. We will be kicking off with them next week, Howick will be a new sponsor moving forward next week along with Forward Solutions Group. So we're both excited uh, on the show to have you as our sponsor. We can't do it without you. All right, with that said, let's hop into this everybody because at Dave Cooper Live, we are bringing you the people and the processes that are building it better. Our guests and topics include experts in building systems to building science, building codes, and the tech used to build it better. We are always seeking out the best and the brightest in construction and discovering all of the innovative ways that buildings come to life. And today, we are gonna kick it off right now with Rick Murdoch. Hey, Rick, how are you, buddy? Uh, good morning, thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure being on your show. I love what you're doing in the education. Awesome, well, listen, it's a pleasure having you on the show. You know, I, I even told you before the show, you know, we had an opportunity to talk. I have been hearing about Autoval for so long now and to finally have this conversation and for you to be gracious enough to take, you know, an hour out of your day to spend it with us and our audience uh, to me is absolutely amazing. And we had, as you know, Merrick on the, on the show not too long ago. Uh, and I mean, I don't know, I don't know how you're going to top her first of all, but we're going to give it, we're going to give it a try, right? Yeah, I don't think I can, but I'll do my best. I love it. I love it. So Rick, I, one, Rick is the CEO of Audible, founder of Audible. Rick, before we get started, why don't you take a moment to tell us a little bit about yourself? And I don't mean just a little bit. We want to know everything about you from the moment you were born to the very moment, this very moment in time. And do not leave out any of the good stuff in the hospital because we will call your mother, Rick. So let's hear it. But you only have about two minutes to do it. Okay. So as old as I am, I'll make it short and brief. Uh, I born in Big Spring, Texas. Got into the industry in Big, Big Spring, Texas in 1976. Uh, I'm one of seven siblings. I've uh, enjoyed the industry my entire career. I've got a, I'm a father of three wonderful daughters. So I've always been outnumbered uh, and they've molded me into the person I am today. Thank goodness. Uh, and then really advanced through the industry. I uh, have worked all over the United States with different manufacturing companies, running different operations and being involved in it. I understand the uh, modular industry from the ground up, and that's from the manufacturing plant all the way through management, all the way through business development and so forth. And so it's been a great opportunity uh, to enjoy the successes I've had within the industry and being mentored by so many people that were so knowledgeable about the industry from days past and still are continuing in it. So it's been, it's been awesome. Uh, Moved up to Boise in 1989 and went to work for uh, a, a great company at that time, Gurdon. 
which uh, was later acquired by myself and a partner of mine in 2000, I believe, 2001. Uh, and that's really when we made the transition from manufactured housing over to the modular industry. Uh, enjoyed that experience with my partner and the wicked knowledge that he had. And we took off and we changed our mold and went from manufactured housing to modular construction and then immediately went into multifamily, multi-story uh, modular construction and really set the way for what was going to happen in the Western United States with modular. So it was really from there that I sprung off and was able to left that company in 2015 and started Prefab Logic with a partner, uh, Curtis Fletcher. Uh, and that was a new experience as well because that was a new type of company. It was the first of its kind. And that was a company that really worked with with uh, architects and developers and general contractors, really educating them on what does it mean to build modular and then helping them with the engineering process, the modeling so we could take buildings and turn it into modular construction. And we went from there and a uh, very successful company I'm very proud of, but that's what led me into Audible. Uh, I happened to see a, an ad about uh, some automation in Omaha, Nebraska that was gonna be exampled there. So I booked a flight and took off and went up there and I was amazed at uh, what I saw with the potential for automation and really how it could affect uh, manufacturing and affect those who love manufacturing. That yeah. got my juices stirred up again for uh, another facility. And that's All when right. was created. Well, hey, it's been a good show. Thanks, Rick. Man, I appreciate it. No. Hey, I mean, <laughs> that's a ton. And, you know, we had we, we, we had Doug Pill on recently as well, not too long ago. Let's let's first go. All right. You, you're starting out. You guys are already in line to win major awards, which I think is amazing. So I want to just get this out of the way. You're, you're doing amazing things before a lot of amazing things have even happened. And this is what's really great. And when I say that, I mean it in a way that you're taking your plan to the next level. You're using automation, you're using robotics. Uh, you have a culture like no other that, you know, that I've seen or heard of in the industry just yet. And we're going to get into all of those things. But the Ivory Prize, I mean, you're in line for that. That's a big award. So congratulations. Well, thank you. That was a very nice compliment. Uh, we made the uh, top 25 list and uh, we'll see where it goes from there. They'll choose the top 10 and they'll choose down to the finalist. But um, yeah. It's amazing because we are a great company with a lot of uh, amazing uh, companies that were awarded in that prize and they're part of it and part of the solution. Right. Yeah, well, listen, I'm, I'm hoping when we are out there in a few more weeks and we have the opportunity to live stream on location, whether at the factory or one of your, at one of your locations that you're building something, uh, maybe we can maybe we can help you win some more of those awards, you know, so that would be a lot of fun for us to be part of that with you. All right. Let's get into Audible a little bit. Let's talk about uh, the purpose of Audible, the reason behind Audible. Like, give us, give us, if you were to give me an elevator pitch on why Audible, that's kind of what I'm, I'm looking for. What is it doing? Uh, Audible is uh, really changing uh, the way construction is done. And that was done for many different reasons. Uh, one of it was, um, if you looked at uh, manufacturing plants across the country, and even construction in general, there's a lot of heavy lifting that goes on from the people. They're actually building these modules and building these apartment buildings and so forth. And so one of the things I saw in the automation that I thought would be extremely useful to all of our people in, in this industry and our solution years here at Audible was that we would go to automation and robotics and take the heavy lifting off people. Uh, take that back breaking work off and put that on machines because machines don't care how much they lift. They don't care how long they work. And so that was part of the part of the vision in this. And the other part was precision. The other part of it was speed and the speed in which we could get things done and the preciseness of how we could do it. And so in doing all those things, you uh, reduce your cost. And so I uh, went to a group uh, with the vision of doing it, uh, Pacific Companies, uh, one of the partners in Audible, who is a major developer in the Western United States and approached him. I'd done business with him before in the past with uh, my other company and we had built apartment projects for him and so he had a good flavor for what modular was and he had great frustration with the typical way that you do construction with cost overruns, timing overruns, all those different things and so I won't say immediately but also uh, almost immediately he was very very interested and he signed up uh, with me to help get this thing kicked off and to do the first 
automated modular uh, robotic plant. Yeah, I kick it off. I mean, it's off, it's running. I love it. You're absolutely right. And I think this is uh, amazing. So if, if I was a guest at, at AutoVol, which I, I'm hoping to be real soon, but for the people out there, can you can you paint can you paint a picture of how it's laid out, how your productions kind of work? And I know I know you have some IP and intellectual property and all that stuff, but can you walk us through the visual of what we can expect when we do come out there to live stream? How automated is it? How many people work on the floor? Are these things you can share with us? Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, here's what you would see if you came to the plant. You would see a 400,000 square foot building. You'd see about 40 percent of that building taken up with automation and robotics. And those are basically uh, production lines. And so if you can imagine a wall line uh, being built with uh, automation and robotics. Yeah. And so normally where you would have a whole host of people in there with doing the manual labor and the heavy lifting. Now we have automation, we have conveyor belts and we have robots. And so they do the framing. Our robots do our framing for us. They do all the fastening for us with precision. Uh, they do all the gluing of all the structures. The robots place the sheathing uh, where it's appropriately placed. And then the robots come back and they secure all of that. And then it extrudes over into a, another area where all the route outs and cutouts right. are made for all your electrical and so forth in the walls. And then it tilts up and it goes into an MEP rack, a mechanical rack where we yep. finish that off. And then we actually set it on a module. So you'd have that, you'd see that line for the wall area, then you'd see another line that builds floors and ceilings, pretty yep. much the same way that they do lines. I, I love it. So I mean, you got you got scissor lifts, you got you got scissor tables, you got everything going on in there and moving it. I mean, this is amazing because you know when I say amazing, one of the things that you're doing differently, especially when using volumetric as as the 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 way that you chose to 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 build is one, you're you're saving on labor. And what I mean by labor, right? There's a lot of wear and tear when you're building. Now we can now we can have larger sheets of lumber. Laborers and and and, and employees or, or or team members, whoever it is on the floor, and we're going to get into the cultural words, and I'm doing that on purpose. They 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 can get a lot more work done with a, with a very little stress on their bodies, which gives them the longevity of their careers which gives you a longevity of employees, happier employee, happier people that work with you, I should say. Um, there, there's a lot of value in this that you're probably seeing that maybe you didn't really know in the beginning. Is there anything else outside of the robotics on what it's doing and what you're seeing as far as the culture and the employees go? Uh, it is. Uh, you know, uh, first of all, I'll, I'll emphasize the heavy lifting has been taken off in those construction areas yeah. and it reduces the number of labor uh, our people that we have to really build those things. And so we're building walls uh, right now and we're doing that with four or five different people where normally it would be uh, teens of people. Yeah. So that's been real critical. And then the precision of it. So anytime you're building something, the more precision you have in the construction, the better off the finishes are. And so we've really taken our culture to where we've got people that uh, we've brought in that understand software, that understand programming, that understand robotics. And so that opened up a new door uh, for right. a different type of employee than what our industry is usually uh, uh, working with, uh, which also attracted a lot of young people. And our industry needs young people that really have an interest in, in what we're doing. So it attracted those. Uh, it really got back to the trades where we could concentrate on the trades uh, and set up our plants so our, our workforce and our solution here is there could do all the trades and be able to do those in an easy, comfortable way or as easy as comfortable as we can thus right. far and be able to produce. Uh, our culture is uh, one that uh, I believe is like no other. It's something that I really enjoy. I think uh, our solution here is enjoy it because it's a family. And that's what we've really created at Audible. We've created a family. And here's what we try to do is within our family, within our teams, and within the 117 employees that we have working with Audible, we try to take care of each other first. And we truly believe that if each of us take care of each other every day, we volunteer where there's issues, we're always there to help and lend a, hand, a lending hand to each other, then our customer will be totally satisfied because we're to produce a better product in a less amount of time. And the expertise that goes into that will show in the product. Yeah, I love it. I'm, I'm so happy you said the word solutioneers. I think, you know, it, it, it's so important. It says a lot about how you treat uh, the people that work with you at, at AutoVol. And 
it makes a big, big difference the way that you guys are going about, uh, you know, the people that are on your team and their longevity of being on the team. And I want everybody out there to hear this because this is part of my soapbox, but I'm not going to put it up there just yet. You're attracting young people. You're using robots. You're using high end technology. You're using you're using um, design technology, 3D BIM. You're feeding automation. If we want young people in our industry, we need to do what they're good at, and it is this. And we're only we're only scratching the surface on what some of these uh, younger folks are capable of doing. That's why we're on Twitch, Rick. I keep saying it. We're going where they're at. Go to Twitch, watch these kids play these virtual games. You will think it is as real as they're sitting in front of somebody across from them. If they can do that, and NASA can build off site in space without having to having to do the old Jerry uh, McCahey quote of, uh, you know, double check or confirm dimensions on site. There's an exact word, I'm losing it right now. But, but you're doing it. This is important, yeah. super important. Dave, that's, that's, that's important to us. You know, right now, yeah. if you looked at our if you looked at our team of solutioneers, our age group is from 19 to 68. Right. Uh, there's reasons for that. Uh, we need the young people. We need their fresh minds. We need to have that information that they know that someone like me wouldn't know. And right. uh, they're smarter in those events than I am. And so when I look at that, uh, I think the great recipe for success is right. age and youth, right? It yeah. takes older and younger to, to build the future. It takes the experience that's been done with older people and those that more experienced to mentor and the younger people with all that vital information that they grew up with that we didn't. And right. combine all those things and you have a great future uh, for a young company that can continue to progress uh, long after I'm gone and yeah. really shape the industry. So it's, yeah. it's been remarkable and the wealth of knowledge we've gotten from those folks is incredible. Well, that, I mean, that's just it. I remember, you know, uh, being an apprentice and intern and learning the skill of modular construction. I was a modular builder. And at one point I looked at my counterpart, my mentor, and I asked, when does the student become the teacher? Because that would, that's what happens. Eventually you know they surpass. Right? Uh, I can remember back in my day when I was sitting around the room with uh, people my age that were running companies and I was working for them and so forth. And I had some great mentors. They taught me. And today I, I got the pleasure of being in the place that they used to be in. And the focus is on how do we build the industry? How do we take young people, get them interested in, sure. in what we do in solving issues through manufacturing? And how do we make them winners and the future leaders of our industry? And so that's really what we're focused on. And Audible really takes the approach of building a company from the bottom up instead of the top down. Right. Yeah. And the more education we can give them and the more opportunity to expand, then the better the company will succeed. Yeah, 100 percent, 100 percent. All right, everybody, if you're just joining us, we have Rick Murdoch, CEO of Audible on with us today. Please hit that like and share button. We need to spread the word of what we are doing here on Dave Cooper Live. We need to spread the education. We need to spread the knowledge. And it takes every one of you out there to help us do that. Each time you share these posts, thousands and thousands of people have the opportunity to join us. So just Put it out there. Hit that like button now and hit that share button. And if you're not following Audible and you're not following Merrick and you're not following Rick and everybody else that works there, you should. And you should follow them and you should like and share what they're doing as well. All right, Rick, let's get into the nuts and bolts, man. You know, so we're looking at 400,000 square feet. How much volume can you put out the door with, with a manufacturing facility such as that with the robotics and the skilled workforce that you now have in place? Well, the, the uh, automation and robotics uh, is uh, set up in the plant to eventually build 2,000 modules a year, right? And wow. so if you look at that in terms, uh, if you were working a five-day week, that's eight modules a day, one every hour. Yep. Uh, so that's what it was designed for. Obviously, we're a new company. We just started building in May. Uh, okay. And we're at uh, two modules per day now, getting ready to take it to 19 per week. Uh, we're a company that really uh, looked at our solutioneers and gave everybody the opportunity to work a four day week instead of a five day week. And that was really for the convenience of all of our solutioneers and give them right. a time with their family or a time to take care of business that they needed to in a day where it doesn't cost them anything uh, or just give them three days out of the week to relax and regroup uh, for another four days of, of good work. Right. I love so, it. Did you hear that, Jen? I'm working four days a week now. Rick said no. <laughs> Rick said so. 
No, I, I think I think that's that's brilliant. You know, so I mean, right now in this country, we have a housing demand. We have an affordability crisis. Uh, I mean, if you can start with just one manufacturing facility putting out, you know, 2000 modules, uh, you know, it takes a big chunk out of what we have going on. It doesn't solve it by a long shot. But man, is it a great step forward? How many people, how many manufacturers, how many builders out there? And if you're in the audience, I'd like to know, can build that many uh, modules and put them out, put them out there to the public for people to use and live in. I don't think anybody yet. Is there anybody out there that can do that? Not out of one thing that I know of uh, that, yeah. that can do that or, or, or have reached those goals. But I, I, I do know this, that the demand is unbelievable for affordable housing. Right. And I know that there's millions of units needed just in some locations, uh, California, all the major metropolitan areas. Uh, there's, there's such a demand for housing. And when you look at a manufacturing plant that can produce 2000 modules annually, that's a drop in the bucket towards the need. But that's also right. part of the vision. That's part of the vision of taking this operation, taking what we're doing and what we're learning it and expanding it across the country uh, and bringing us to a mainstream way of building. And I think that will be done through the automation technology, the robotics and education. So yeah, for sure. To grow. Yeah, so, th so I love it. So, I mean, the plan is once you once you fine tune this 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 manufacturing facility, the idea is to kind of take the show on the road. Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, you know what? We'd like to expand and we'd like to yeah. multiply uh, throughout the country. And if you think about it, I mean, we've got all these solution that are doing this for the first time uh, that it's been done. So they've got an education that no other will have when we get it done. And if you're right. going to expand and grow a company, uh, you grow it from within inside. Uh, and so you give them the opportunity for growth. You give them the opportunity to one day be part of a, a, another facility that's doing this. And we try to expand that with the knowledge and education that we're getting from it. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. So as you expand this, obviously that takes a workforce. It takes skilled, it takes skilled, knowledgeable uh, people to come in and actually and, and actually build this. And this is uh, what we're going to go to here after we take a break and take some comments and questions. But let's talk about, you know, how you feel about education. How do we get the education out there? The colleges, uh, the schools, the trade schools, there is very few. Stonepile Construction College is only one of the few that is teaching and educating about modern methods of construction, volumetric, panelization, whatever the case is and whatever you're into, how are we going to get the education out there? We're going to start our next conversation as soon as we come back from the break. Sound good? Sounds great. All right. So we're going to run through. We're going to say hi to a few people. Listen, I see the comment sections building up. All right. Uh, if you have a question from this point forward, please put a cue uh, next before your question so it's easy for me to pick out. There's a lot of comments here. Uh, Rick, I'm glad you cleared your whole day for us. This is awesome. <laughs> All right. Charles Warfield says, hello, Rick and Dave. We're going to say hi to a bunch of people here. Ah, oh, Doug Pill. You don't know that guy, do you? Oh, my goodness. Do I know Doug? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Doug's yeah. heading up our prefab logic company. Right. That's right. CEO. So, uh, and doing an awesome job. So, I know him very well. Yeah. So, hey, listen. Uh, so, a lot of you probably don't know that prefab logic is uh, also something Rick is. Uh, uh, partner owner in or what have you. So I think with that said, we had Doug on the show a few months ago. If you want to check it out, go to our YouTube channel. And while you're there, subscribe, because if you don't, you're wrong. That's all I have to say about it. All right. We got John Jaworski. Hey, congratulations, he says. All right. See, I got a lot of this going on right now. One year, Rick. Can you believe we've done this for one year, six days straight, and we didn't miss one single day? Maybe late, but never missed. That's terrific. That's so I love it. I love it. All right, Colby and everybody else. I don't know if you know Colby Swanson. Congrats, Dave. Let's get into some good stuff moving down the road here. Rick Snyder, Audible is an amazing place. Kudos to everyone involved coming from LinkedIn. Outstanding. Thank you so much for that uh, comment. Nick. Amazing. All right. Rick Hawkins, applaud one year of informative content. I love it. I love it. All right, Henry Mickelberg. I was fortunate enough to escort Marriott around the various volumetric factories in Boise a few years ago. It's really heartening to see these really hardworking, timely people finally getting the recognition they deserve. Outstanding. The Mickelberg always writes something nice. I love it. Hey, what's happening, Henry? Thank you so much for the comment. Love it. 
Joel Hutchins, Splash Modular, Revaya. Rick, can you talk through the impotence of DFMA, especially when you are running robotics? So for everybody out there that is not in our inner circle, DFMA, Design for Manufacturer Assembly, is what that means. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking I understand the question, uh, but uh, a little bit more precise. What, what is? I guess he's asking for the importance. Sorry, the, the importance? importance of DFMA. Uh, it's extremely important uh, uh, throughout the whole process, and it's taken a lot of very educated and a lot of people that know a lot more than I do to put all that together in order to uh, come up with the end results of what we're doing. And yeah. so, a, a large focus is on that. Uh, and that's done by some wonderful partners that none of this would be possible to do without. Uh, and that is coming through uh, House of Robotics uh, here in Napa, Idaho. The one yeah. that's doing the integration for everything that we're doing. Prefab Logic, who is doing all the engineering right down into giving us all the gran granular details so that Audible can take that and write the HMIs that tell the robots what to do. Uh, Pacific communities who none of this would be possible without uh, partners in this uh, as a development company that's put, helping put all these pieces together. Uh, Wixfer, uh, a group out of Sweden that I've been working with now for three years in developing all of this. Wicked smart guys yeah. that understand that it can build the end of arm tools and so forth. So it's been a uh, it's been a success because we've surrounded ourselves with people that know their business extremely well and uh, have worked with us and they've learned as much as we have. And that's how our company has really got, gotten put together. And so all those details are extremely important. It really is. Rick, how important is it to design up front when building volumetric or any system? Uh, so builders or developers, I know we have a lot of investment bankers out there that listen to us. How important is it to start in the beginning with the end in mind versus coming in halfway through? To get the book, to get the full benefit of modular construction, it's extremely important. Yeah. Uh, we need to be right there when the architect begins, right? right. Uh, to help with the modeling, help uh, help them understand what works for modular construction and manufacturing and what doesn't work. Uh, do the best practices. It makes it much more. Uh, it makes it easier for modular construction to be able to pull off uh, with success. Uh, so we like to be at the very starting gate of it uh, so we can yeah. help uh, and work with structural engineers, MEP engineers, the architects and so forth to get the building design and modeled correctly so we can come in and, and produce it through a manufacturing plant, plant efficiently. Pretty That's right. We, we say it all the time that, you know, uh, the manufacturer is your partner. They're not a supplier. They're a partner in what you do and they can really help guide and put the efficiencies in place when you're designing uh, for, you know, modular construction. So I think it's it super, super important. Exactly. And it's a major component to controlling the cost and lowering the cost. Uh, it's always yeah. much less expensive to build something when you started from the beginning and designed it that way than to try to go remake it after it's already been done. So it's, it's critical. Yeah, I agree. I agree. All right. A couple more comments here. Hey, Joe, uh, that's Joe Hutchins. Joe Butler is in the house. What's happening, Joe? Forward Solutions Group. Joe's been a, his team's been a sponsor of ours for a while. So uh, he says, looking forward to hearing more about Audible, pushing the boundaries in automation. Uh, Joe, thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. And thanks for all your support. I love it. George Ryman, Phoenix, Arizona. Good morning, George. All right, we're going to move forward here to a couple more comments and we're going to get back into our conversation. Oh, we got Merrick. I don't know if you know Merrick. Do you know Merrick? I know Merrick. Merrick is like a top guest on uh, Increasing Influence a couple of, what is it, two weeks now. Henry Mickelberg, Rick's past company, was the first to build a modular Marriott hotel, which kicked off the hotel industry building using offsite methods. Pretty cool stuff. See, Rick, we know what's so cool about this show. What's cool about it is we get to learn things about you on a personal level that people wouldn't have known, doesn't come up in our conversation, but it also gets all these other people the opportunity who you may not know or they may not know you to either ask somebody a question that they, a question that they couldn't get in front of if they were at a trade show because there's too many people that want your attention. It's a conversation and these conversations and these, these people that tune in every day, and there's a lot of them right now, uh, is what's going to help us change our industry. And that's, that's why I love to do it. I agree. Um, okay. 
So let's see what we have. Oh, sorry, did you put that up, John? Uh, Benyon 1974. What is the structural material of your modular solution? Uh, we're a wood frame uh, modular yep. company. Uh, uh, there's steel, there's wood. Uh, we prefer the wood. Uh, that gives you the ability to go five stories and five stories above podium. Uh, yep. And it's uh, for us, it's the, uh, the most common uh, in the Western United States at this time. So, yeah, we're wood construction. I love it. I love it. And this is Twitch, everybody. Twitch, told you we're growing on Twitch. Uh, what is the capacity and size of modules you produce was another follow up question. Uh, you know, our maximum modular size would be a 16 by 74, 76 foot unit uh, would be our maximum size. But we build different size. Our most common size that we build would be 14.6 uh, by 74. Uh, our first project was right around those sizes. And uh, that's probably the most common. Love it. All right. Perfect. All right, Charles, the Audible team and facilities are truly impressive. And Rick is one of the most thoughtful and knowledgeable people I've ever had the privilege of spending time with. Charles Warfield. You. Wow, that's pretty cool. All right, Archie Williams. I've known Rick Murdoch for almost 40 years and he's always thought outside the box. No pun intended, I'm sure. Great guy to work with and for. All right, people like you, Rick. This is important to success. Guys, uh, Archie, Archie Williams, the guy that was just up there, uh, he started in the industry about the same time I did. And we worked together for years and years and years. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. And Archie's coming to us from Facebook today. Archie, thanks so much. Please hit that like and share button on Facebook. We need more Facebook subscribers. Archie's right. getting ready to come visit me and see the plant for himself. Oh, cool. Well, listen, we're going to live stream from there. So don't be doing that without us. All right. I love it. Uh, Randy Duggan. Rick has been on the forefront of many innovations in the modular industry. Very true. I love it. Thank you, Randy. Man, I told you, Rick, you better, you better, you better order some dinner out. You're going to be here a while. Colby, <laughs> Colby Swanson in the house. Hey, Colby, would love to hear dialogue about factory automation outside of framing walls, floors, ceilings. Where are the next big automation opportunities? You know, that's still to be discovered yet. There's um, uh, to really understand the capabilities of what's out there. There's different areas that I would love to see uh, be more automated uh, for many reasons. But at this time, our focus has to really be on those components that we're already doing, because the from from our understanding, the automation that would be uh, necessary to do other apps hasn't been developed yet. And we're hoping to develop that as we move forward. You know, part of our goal is, is not only do what we're doing and perfect it, but also go farther outside of the box and see what else we can create to take the loads yeah. off of our solution ears. That's right. You know, I already know you're looking to the future. And my, my guess is, if I'm a guessing person, Rick, that uh, the wheels are already turning on what you would do differently or better moving forward. It happens in everything, right? And I, I, I would okay. imagine. So I love it. I love it. All right, and I'm sure you're going to share that with us in the future too, but let's get back to the show for everybody else out there. We will come back to the comments and questions and and uh, the patent on the backs and all the fun stuff. Continue having your conversation off to the side. Let's get into education and changing uh, training and the change required for, for the industry. Rick, what are, what are your thoughts on how do we get more young people into it? How do we educate the workforce that is out there? Because there's a workforce. They're just not skilled at what we're doing at the moment. Um, and what do you find is going to be the challenges? And, and how do we move this forward? You know, that uh, you're correct. Uh, you know, back when I was in school, they taught all the trades in school. It was classes that you took. So when you came out of school, uh, you could either be a mental genius or you'd know how to do different things in, in, in construction or welding or metal or so forth. And for whatever reason, they stopped training uh, students that years ago. And I'm hoping that we can get back into that because it's needed. But the, but the training that does come uh, and modular manufacturers are excellent for that training because each one of the scopes and each one of the trades from carpentry to electrical to plumbing, all those are utilized with, inside of a modular manufacturing plant. And the opportunity that we have for education is when we bring new people in that don't have those skill sets, uh, they're learning all those skill sets in a controlled environment and they're right. learning that in smaller pieces so they don't have to bite off the whole chunk at one time. So if you're an electrical person that's coming into modular manufacturing, we can train you in different bits and pieces of it until you understand all of it. And we're in a controlled environment where there's lots of education and there's lots of people that to mentor and right. train. 
So it makes a perfect, uh, perfect area to bring new people in without those trade skills and be able to train them in a, in a factory environment. And, and bring them into the workforce, right? Because they would end up with their apprenticeship, and they they could get their electrical license, plumbing license. They could they could they could move to the next level with all of that. Is that accurate? That's correct, Dave. Uh, because we we encourage that, and we also help them do that. Uh, right. If you're in part of Audubon and you're one of those trades, then we're anxious to help you go to school, help you pay for your schooling, and be able to get that license for your future. Uh, in the hopes that you'll stay right with the company, put those licenses to work and help us grow this industry. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. I mean, this is the only one of the only ways it's going to happen to get the skilled trade is to get them into the manufacturing facilities, really see how it's done, work with the experts that are already in the industry. And then they can either stay and hopefully they do stay or they take that knowledge to the next manufacturing facility you open up or just take the knowledge and share it regardless. It's a win no matter how we look at it in this industry. Yeah, if they do nothing but go train someone else, right? That's right. Someone else is getting the knowledge. We're paying it forward. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, one of the things, and I know we were talking about it, Rick, and I'm, I want to say it since we have such a big audience, we are on the road and we are taking our show on the road and we are live streaming into universities right now. We are going to be stopping at colleges and, and we're going to be stopping at trade schools and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna continue educating uh, the, the students that are out there because we need to go where they are at. I don't know if you know Steve Basic. He's a YouTuber on with Matt Reisinger and they teach architecture. And I'm using this as an example, uh, but high efficiency, net zero, passive house design. His daughter just got out of architecture of school and they taught none of that. They didn't teach anything about energy efficiency. They didn't teach anything about passive house and how to build more efficiently, how to build healthier, how to build friendlier. It has to start somewhere. So hope, hopefully, hopefully we can help you uh, and everybody else out there in the industry be part of this solution and bring the education to where they're at. I love it. Yeah, that's pretty exciting and it's needed. Uh, so I, I love what you guys are doing on that because I believe with the demand that we've got out there in the seriousness of our housing crisis that uh, there should yeah. be training, there should be teaching uh, at the university levels uh, because it is a new way of doing this construction. It's a uh, it's a way that uh, most people are not familiar with and they don't understand all the benefits. And I think that when the general public really understands what we do, how we do it, why we do it, and how it really fits and right. the savings that you get with it, I think there'd be a lot more interest to help us take this mainstream. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree, completely agree. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna become a sounding board for AutoVol that you're looking to train young people in electrician, robotics. So. When there's a post that goes up for a job, they at least are following you and by gosh, they can uh, they can apply. What do you think? Would that work for you if I did that? I think it's awesome. You can send them our way because we're on, we're in a growth period right now. Today, right. we're looking for 40 more solution ears. In another two or three months, we'll be looking for 40 more solution ears and bring them into the fold and give them the education and training and the opportunity that Audible has to offer. I love it. I love it. I'm on board all about it. All right, let's move on to our next question. And after we answer this question, we're going to move back to some comments uh, from our guests that are out there. Let's talk about defining the value of offsite construction and defining the efficiencies. What are your thoughts on how you would define the value of offsite construction? Uh, when done correctly, here's, here's the value in my mind is in normal construction, uh, you're working on the site, you're preparing the site and nothing can start until you get the site done and then you start building and you're building in pieces. Uh, with modular construction, you have the opportunity to where your developer and your general contractor can be out there prepping the site, running the services, doing the grading, doing all those things they do with the property and at the same time be building their building out of a manufacturing plant. So they're not building the building after that, it's already being built. And so once that's done, it can be delivered, it can be erected, and it can be finished in an amazing short period of time. And yeah. from, my, from my view, we cut about 40% off of a build time. And 40%, if nothing else, results in time and money, right? Sure. It gives opportunity to lease properties quicker. It gets opportunity to set, set yourself up for sec, success just that much quicker. Yeah, you know what? You're absolutely right. Being a modular builder for, for over 20 years, 
It's exactly it. Most of the headaches on a lot of builds come in the land. It's the unknown. We don't have x-ray vision all the time. You never know where that underground stream just pops up and fills a foundation or any of these things. But this is where the efficiencies come in. Because when that groundwork starts and you have a permit, at the same time, you're timing your production time. So when that groundwork and foundation and all that's in place, you're not losing time just starting to put your plates on and then you know start framing you're bringing a modular structure, 70%, 80%, 90%, ready to go on that foundation. It's not rocket science. Anybody can figure out that that's a huge time saver. Yeah, you know, it's it's one of those things to where it's it's pretty amazing. And, and I know that the public is amazed when modular construction is done in their area. And it's because they'll drive by and the land's being prepped and so forth. And then in a matter of days or a couple of weeks, they look up and a building standing there. Right. And that's yeah. when it really hits you and think, wow, uh, two weeks ago, I drove by there and this was dirt. Today, I'm driving by there and there's a building standing there. How did it get there? Right. And that's one of the benefits. It, it is one of the benefits. And you're absolutely right. It's amazing, too. Even when you have people watching the streets as we're doing our set, they'll run you over. They'll go to work. Nothing's there. They come home and then all of a sudden there's an entire building and they do this. It doesn't even matter if you have police escorts. Like you got to watch your back. They get it. It's an amazing thing. Um, all right, so we're going to get into a little bit more, uh, more of that as we move forward. We have some questions here. Henry Mickelberg, surely Rick is the guy to contribute to the ongoing, what are the tangible value propositions, benefits of digitizing and automation? Question. Uh, you, you know, I think it's several things, and one of them is precision. Uh, automation uh, offers precision that you you wouldn't normally get from uh, from any other source because again we're human uh, and when you're framing and when you're using a nail gun and when you're using a screw gun all those obstacles are heavy and so after so long a period of time we're human our arms they vary uh, we don't always put the placement uh, faster as where we want to put them we always don't we don't always do things exactly what we'd love to do and we know to do but it's because we're human and uh, our, our body gives out uh, automation gives you that opportunity to get the precision in the very beginning and in the construction piece of that. Uh, it also gives you the ability to look back and be able to get the data that's necessary to understand what your true costs are, what the things that you need to work on, where is the time spent that could be carved out to make this quicker, better, and less expensive. So all those things are critical and the automation and robotics gives you an opportunity to do that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it does. I, I just remembered the word, the field verified word, right? Can you, like, why are we field verifying with digitization, with the automation, with the BIM, with the 3D modeling? You can even go out to a site, take a picture, and that picture and those data points can be brought back in to make any adjustments. You know, it, it's just amazing what's happening now. We shouldn't have to field verify anymore. It should really speed up the process of everything we do. Let us be more precise. And it also, cuts down on the cost, the efficiencies, and the overruns. You know, uh, speaking of that, I, I can tell you the Prefab Log just developed a VR uh, virtual reality with our, with our construction. And it's really a 3D model. So that one of the things that's been exciting to see is when you can see your drawings and you can see a building in a 3D model, uh, you can eliminate so many different mistakes that could be very costly because you see what's in the way. You see uh, paths that don't really work. You see openings that need to be changed, but you're being able to see that as if you're walking through the building after it's built. And so all that information coming up front helps us to design better, helps us to build better and miss all those things that might cost us time and dollars. Yeah, 100 percent for sure, for sure. All right. More questions, comments. Here we go. Has Audible developed a building platform or is each project a one off? Great question. Steve Burrows in the house. Hey, Steve. Uh, out of all, we do have one offs, but uh, because developers, everyone's going to build something different for what their needs are. So we do have one offs. But at the same token, we take those one offs and what we try to do is standardize as much as possible with the one offs so that you can actually use the same models. You can actually use the same construction and come up with multiple different buildings. Uh, because at the end of the day, when you look at the inside of a building, all those can be similar and they can be built in the same way. They can be similar structures and then make the outside look like anything you'd like it to look like. 
And so you could be looking at four or five different buildings and walk through the door and there's several standard design, standardized similarities throughout those buildings. And that really gives us the opportunity to have more efficiency. It gives yeah. us an opportunity to produce quicker and with better quality. Yeah, I agree. And, I, and I, the automation, the digitization, the BIM modeling, again, all of this information can be fed to the robotics that's happening, which allows you to make some customization on, you know, and do things where they're not all one off. The, the computers are talking, right? And we all know computers are faster than the mind and more accurate when they're doing things versus cutting two by fours across your boot, you know, so to speak. So I, I, I can see that as actually being, being very realistic. Yeah, on the automation piece, I mean, uh, the robots are going to do what they're told to do. And our That's service engineers right. are the ones that are writing that and be able to tell them what to do. So, yeah, you can make different changes. Uh, there's There can be some flexibility in that as long as you don't exceed what the capabilities of the robotics are. So, yeah, uh, we build several different ways, uh, but we try to keep as much standard as we can. Yeah, perfect. All right. Thank you for that question. All right, Joe Butler. Rick, can you talk about your man? Talk about how you manage the primary factory constraints in drywall in finishing with the massive uptick in structural performance at the front end of the factory. You know, uh, <laughs> the uh, drywall is, is, is always a challenge and it's been a challenge in every plant that I've been associated with, but it's more about the uh, time it takes to really cure out and do it correctly. I think one of the things that's really helped us successful with our drywall so we don't have some of the issues is automation and robotics. Uh, you know, if you're working in a normal plant and you're hanging drywall, then you're spreading your glue and you're doing so forth. And then you're sliding your materials over the top of it, which basically wipes off some of the things that you've been trying to accomplish. Uh, with automation and robotics, you can do all that. You can uh, glue the surfaces. You can set panels straight down into it. You can fasten those out without moving it around and really let that set in because that's an important part of our construction process. And then, when you're dealing with drywall and so forth, you're, you set your drywall to where it doesn't make contact with the ceiling or, or the floor. And that way it has no stress and it has no compaction when you're setting one module on top of another, which shows to be very critical in, in the end results of drywall. Right, perfect. Joe, thank you so much for that question. Great, great answer. All right, we're gonna take this as the last question, then we're gonna get back into our conversation. Randall King. Is the banking industry catching up with the different cadence needed to finance modular? Now this is, you go, I got a soapbox for this one too. Uh, you know what, I would say that in our experience, yes it is. And it's not that all, uh, all of those are catching up the banking industry, but some of them have really ex uh, seen the value. And the big difference is, is if you're in manufacturing, uh, your material costs are all up front, different than what it is on, on site. And so, you know, banking institutes look at that and they like to be able to touch what they paid for. Uh, so, but they are understanding that manufacturing, all the materials need to be in place before you start manufacturing. Otherwise your costs can be raised through shortages or so forth. Uh, so they are catching on. Uh, we've got a big group of uh, bankers coming out to Audubon here soon uh, to really see what we're doing, but they're understanding the value of it. And here's what I would say is that the more qualified manufacturers, the more great manufacturers like we have in the Valley, such as Nashua Builders, Gurdon, Indy Dwell, uh, Northwest Building Systems, all those guys are great manufacturers. And as we increase the number of manufacturers, bankers can look at it and say, we've just lowered our risk, right? Because now there's more than one, there's more than two, right. and successively pull off these type of projects. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. And listen, it's a win for the bank, especially if you have a successful manufacturing business that's been around. Uh, they have to put out very little money up front and they get to see a whole lot of their product before writing some bigger checks. At least how it's, how it's been when I was building, you know, the big check shows up on site and there's, there's, there's just a different way of doing it. You're not relying on, you're not relying on a developer or builder. Uh, you're relying on a manufacturing facility that has very precise automation, very, you know, you can manage things in a controlled environment much easier. I've always found that it's a win-win for the banks, not a win-lose. Yeah, and think about this. Uh, another benefit for banks is once a modular manufacturer gives them, gives them the cost of construction, it doesn't change. It doesn't go over. It is what it is. And once we give it a schedule for delivery, that delivery is made. It's on time. It's within budget from the modular aspect. 
mind blowing, isn't it? Who wouldn't yeah. want to do that? What do you mean? It's not going to have an overrun? <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah, oh my God. Does that mean on my my ten million dollar project, I can put my you know seven hundred fifty thousand dollar contingency money back in my pocket? That's yeah. what those things mean, and that this is where people have to understand the value. Upfront apples to apples is not always the case. You have to look at the life cycle of a project for the perceived value because there isn't a there isn't a traditional site builder out there that doesn't have contingency money set aside because there's always overruns, right? Come on, there is, and there's overruns in time too, right? Yeah. Yeah, and time's a big issue, time's money, right? So yes. no, I, I think modern manufacturing and at least the groups that I just named do an excellent job of proving that truth. Sure, sure. All right, all right, here we go. Darren Sari. hey Darren uh, from LinkedIn today. Randall King, I previously spent 15 years representing construction lenders on conventional and model projects. Short answer is yes. Lenders are getting on board with modular under the right conditions. There it is. And, I, and Darren, I've seen Darren at a lot of the modular and the trade shows. And uh, yeah, he was he was in the finance side. I don't know if you're still in the finance side, but he's been in the finance side of this for quite some time in the project management side. Well, that's the experience we've seen on our side. Uh, they're really yeah. starting to get comfortable because again, uh, they're being educated. They understand what we're trying to do now. And uh, once you get an education and you understand how modular really works, I think you're much more open to the idea of modular construction. For sure. And all right, so we say modular. Let's let's the next part of this conversation is I want to define what modular truly means because we are trying to unite a fragmented industry right now. We are trying to 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 pull all the misconceptions, all the different terminology, all the words that. We all understand talking about ourselves, but it's not going to help us move forward uh, the way we need to be moving forward today. So in your mind, let's start off with, you know, what is modular to you? You use volumetric. Let's talk about this a little bit. Uh, I refer to it as volumetric modular because there's uh, today uh, the word modulars, in my opinion, is used very loosely. Uh, we've got component builders. We've got suppliers. We've got all the, and everybody uses the word modular. Our definition, Audible's definition of volumetric modular is it's a six sided uh, box, right? With the interiors finished and complete. And so when we deliver, we're not delivering parts of a building, we're deli delivering modules that are crane set and put in to tie into a building. But within those modules, those are as complete as they can possibly get. And when I say that, that means all the finishes are done, the flooring's in, we even ship our modules with appliances installed, all those things. And then once the services are connected, you can flip a switch and basically move in. And to me and our group here, that's what volumetric modular is and that's the contribution we make. And the reason why we chose to go that way is because it's about not only saving money with the construction in the modular plant, but also saving money on site because on-site construction is more expensive than in a manufacturing plant environment. That's right. So the more number of trades that we can lessen or the number of those trades that we can lessen on-site is very helpful on-site and curbs their cost as well. So as much as we can cost possibly do inside the plant and finish it in a, in a great quality way, the less that has to be done on-site. And if you look at the overflow of that, the less that has to be done on site and the shorter a period it takes to do it on site, you lessen the impact to the neighborhood around the site that's being built uh, because it's quicker. It's that's right. And so you don't have the environmental impacts that you would normally have in traditional construction. Well, yeah. I mean, think about how happy neighbors are when you're not there for a year and a half. You're only there for six months or even less, even sure. less it's big and all the materials coming in and out and all the trash that has to be removed and so forth and the cleanup. Uh, <clears throat> I, I've been in those areas where they built around me uh, and it's not, yeah. it's not wonderful until they're gone. So nope. yeah, that's right. Cool that. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to put this out. We actually, uh, we won best in show at world of modular this year for some reporting that we did with um, mod logic and access construction with a hospital set. Now this is steel construction, not wood construction. And here's what's important about it. So if there's some new people out here, you can check that out on our YouTube channel. But here's what's so important about it. 7,000 square feet, full hospital, 7,000 square feet of emergency room, pediatric edition, all the pneumatic tubes, all the gas lines, all the MEPs in place 
11 weeks to start seeing patients. This, oh. this place had more stuff going on in it than, than any single family home had going on in it in 11 weeks. That was the disruption of their parking lot, right? The coming and going, and then they're seeing patients. I use that as an example because it did win an award. It was something that we were talking about and part of, but this is exactly what you're saying. Disruption is a major thing, especially today, especially when it's large projects. And when it comes to getting heads on beds like a hospital or a hotel or a multifamily, start bringing, start bringing the patients in, start bringing the money in. Yeah, uh, more immediate relief. Yeah, right. yeah. I love it. I love it. So let's talk about our industry being fragmented. And I'm going to give you some examples. You can play off it or you can go down your own. We have offsite. Some spell it with a hyphen. Some spell it just O-F-F-S-I-T-E. We have modular. We have volumetric. Um, you know, when we look at all of this, uh, we have components. We have panelized wall systems. Is it a system or is it a component? Or does it, you know, in your case, in modular and volumetric, we do six sides. And uh, something like Integra, Jerry McAfee, that's a four side but it's still a system walls, floor, exterior. How, 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 are we gonna, how are we gonna define what we are as an industry so we can all talk the same lingo, not just to ourselves, but for anybody interested in our industry so they can truly understand what it is because I'm confused half the time and I live and breathe it. Uh, and, and ditto, I'm confused uh, half the time and, and I'm, I'm right in the middle of it. Uh, so, I think that um, I think there is a difference between being a component builder or being a volumetric builder. Uh, I think that both uh, answer a cause uh, and they help, right? Uh, but modular construction to me is where you can help the most, and that's by completing something uh, to where you can set it and there's not that much work to be done on site. Mm -hmm. It's not just about the plant, but it's the on site functions as well. So I think that. Um, I think a good way to do that is in, it's interesting because I've been in this all my years and guilty of it myself. If you're a modular manufacturing plant, it's all about secrets and it's all about, this is our secret recipe. It's all about, we can't share this because we've got competitors and so forth. And uh, I'm more of the mindset that modular manufacturers, whether they're, whether they're a component builder or whether they're a volumetric modular plant, we're not competitors. We're the answer to a problem. And the sooner that we can realize that, and the sooner that we can all come together and share our knowledge and share our best practices and keep each other out of the ditch with more successful, successful projects, the better we'll be able to unite. And I believe that draws business. I believe when you've got more than one option and all of them are good and all of them are singing off the same page, that your business increases. And I think that's what it's going to take to take this main street. Is okay. all let down our guards and share what we've learned through all these years of modular construction. Rick, Rick, there's your soapbox because it's the same as my soapbox. <laughs> Rick has a soapbox. I don't care what anybody says. If you have the secret sauce, if you have all the answers, then why are we only 4% of the industry? Make Thank zero you. percent to me. It makes it zero, zero, it makes zero percent to me. It makes, it makes zero, you know, uh, it doesn't make sense at all. So if you're out there, I get proprietary and IP and you're doing stuff to take it to the next level and there's competitive advantages to those things. But for all of us out there that are already on the market, have been open and everybody's seen the inside of the factory and what we're doing, the only way to go forward, sorry about my soapbox here, Rick. I'm, Jenna has your soap, I'm putting my own soapbox up now. The only way to go forward with this is through collaboration. Because guess what? Even with AutoVol, if people don't push you to be better, you'll stay the same way. Look at look at the Hakashuki. Uh, how do you say it? Hakashuki in Japan? I think it is right. Um, nobody's nobody's competing with them. They've been doing it the same way for you know twenty years. Everybody looks at it. We need competition. We need competitors, and we need conversation because that's the only way we get better. Yeah, and then we need to be concerned about the success of all of the industry because yeah. uh, it's like any other industry out there. If you have a failure, we all feel it. Yeah, uh, if right. a failure, it brings doubt to all those that are interested in it and all those right. that may be wanting to finance it. So uh, when I look at it over the Broadway, I, 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 why would any one of us want and allow a manufacturer to fail if there's something we could do to keep them from failing? And most yeah. of that is education. Uh, give them the education and help them as much as they can so we can all be successful 
And that's how you go mainstream with, with any type of industry. I, I 100%, 100% agree. And it was Sekasui. That's what I couldn't get the words out for the life of me. Lots going on. All right. Let's get to some questions and comments, and then we're going to wrap it up. It's it's already it's an hour and three minutes. I'm not even looking at the time. Rack, I didn't I told have any idea what the time was, so awesome. All right. Let's, let, let's have some fun. Let's say hello to some of our guests and answer some questions. Rob Hoskin, I am here. Hey, Audible. Ties in well with the set of disruptive innovators that will transform the economy into the next industrial revolution. Love it. Love it. All right, Rob, thank you for joining us from YouTube. Al Tunisu, how are you, Al? Good to see you today. Thank you for joining us. LinkedIn, in the house. Charles Warfield, question. Hey, somebody did my cue. See, I love it. Uh, I know you have people on your team who oversee installation, but do you think there is a benefit to have an in-house team to complete site work portion of your projects? Now, that's an interesting question, right? How do you control How do you control quality, I think, is what they're, what they're saying there. Versus uh, having outsourced everywhere, I, I think it. I think yes, if it fits the circumstances. Uh, part of the issue there is if you have an on-site team that does all your finishes, then you have to have a pretty healthy backlog of business. Otherwise, that team that does all your interior finishes on-site, they finish that, and then what do they do? Uh, obviously, there's a, a there's an overhead cost to having that group there. Uh, so I think it fits everybody's. Uh, really what fits them and their circumstances. I know for us, we do have an on-site team and our on-site team has been extremely well-trained in manufacturing. They've been part of our manufacturing thing for years with our company. And really what they do, they're, they're our eyes and ear and our on-site education. So if you looked at Audible, part of the things that are common here is when I get in the morning, I've got an on-site report of a project that we're working on. And that's from our team that is looking over our interest as a module manufacturer and how our modules are being used to make sure they're being used appropriately. And so in that report, I understand everything that's going on in the site, including what our company might have done wrong that we need to correct well in advance before it ever becomes a problem. So you also get that blend of the on-site education along with manufacturing education. I know that uh, uh, our COO here, great guy that's leading uh, the operations in our company, he just took his team up to uh, California to one of our sets. Uh, and it was all education based, uh, letting them go up there and see how we're doing as a manufacturer on site and being able to give them the instruction, let them see for themselves ways that we can improve. And they're working hand in hand with our on site team. Love it. Hey, Charles, that was a good question. That got a, that got a great answer, too. All right, we got Mysterious BOJ from Twitch. Oh, man, we got a lot of Twitch people today. What do you think about construction in Switzerland? Twitch in the house, man. I love it. We just started going to Twitch a couple months ago, and we're finally seeing some traction, Rick. It's a big deal. Go you know, it. I don't know what they're doing for construction in Switzerland necessarily. I'm familiar with what they're doing in the UK and Sweden and so forth. Switzerland, I don't really know. But here's what I would tell you, and here's what I would tell you it would be part of the vision is – I've had the opportunity through my career to travel all over the world. Uh, one of the best educations I ever got. And one of the things that I can tell you, I've recognized in every place outside of our borders is their issues are mostly larger than ours with affordable housing, with having housing available. And so when I look at what we're doing at Audible and what our industry is capable of doing as a whole, uh, there's no reason why it's not global because yeah. it can be helpful no matter what country it's in and what borders it cross. It can be helpful. I think it can be uh, designed to be less costly. And I think more advancement needs to be there as well. Yeah, I agree. I agree. All right, Twitch in the house, Mysterious BOJ. Thank you. All right, Pedro. Hey, Pedro was one of our winners yesterday to the uh, International Wood Bay, uh, what was it, Mass Timber Conference. So, yeah, I hope you're enjoying the conference. It was a great giveaway. Uh, Dave and his guests are teaching a lot better than master's degree. Pedro is all the way down in Brazil. Our, our conversation is international. We have people from Brazil, France, uh, Vietnam, Saudi Arabia. So there's, there's a whole bunch of them tuning in. Listen, I know we can't get to everybody's comments and shout outs. There's too many of you today, uh, but we do appreciate everybody being here. But we are going to try and get to some more questions. All right, Michelle, uh, Michael Cunningham, question. Do your modules work parametrically? So define parametrically. 
Yeah, we'll come back to it, Michael. Let, let's hear your word. I, I know somebody out there that can define parametrically, yeah. but you know, we're, we're talking cloud-based modules that can be shared, you know, is how I'm seeing it, but I'd like to see what Michael has to say and what his thought is. Yeah, so put that in the comments. All right, Chad Crosby, question. With Indy Dwell, Nasha, Gordian, Autoval in a small area, uh, did I say Nashua right? I said Nashua. Uh, what uh, are the Nashua concerns Gordian. regarding transportation moving thousands of oversized loads every year? Uh, you know what? I, I, so far, we haven't had anything that would cause us great concerns. Obviously, uh, uh, the infrastructure is very important, so they choose the routes very carefully, and we are shipping uh, lots of units uh, by freeway. And so, but I think the precautions there and all the transportation rules keep us pretty well covered. Uh, we very seldom have accidents. Uh, and most of our loads aren't uh, over with to a point to where I think it causes a great amount of concern. But it is something that we watch for very carefully with experienced drivers and experienced transportation companies because it is important. Yeah, love it, love it. All right, Colby Swanson's busy today. What's up, Colby? Uh, would Rick share what he feels his next new factory should cost based on his experiences with Audible number one factory? You know, I don't know if I have a number put to that yet. Uh, obviously, the first of its kind has been uh, uh, costly and more than what it would be on the next one. But I know that uh, as far as Audible, uh, it's a uh, hundred million dollar investment. And I would say that uh, our next project will be below that uh, by a considerable sum because we've worked out and we understand more. We uh, know some areas that we would probably change in the future that might be more cost effective. But anytime you've done something once and you understand it, the second time you can save dollars. Uh, but I really couldn't put a number on what I think that would be. Yeah, you know what, and listen, for all of you that are out there that want to try volumetric modular construction, it's always going to take you once, twice, three times before you fine tune exactly how it works for you. So a lot of people I hear jump into it, oh, it didn't go the way, you know, I thought, it, well, the devil's in the detail and most site people are not used to the details up front. Get to the details up front, plan ahead, and it'll be a super successful thing for you. All right, great question, uh, Colby. Um, I'm going to have a follow-up question uh, also at the end here, uh, Rick. Pablo Martinez Rodriguez, PhD. All right, we're getting some, some intelligent here. Um, question, apart from the automation in the shop floor, how automated is the process in Audible from design to robot code? Uh, you know what? There's uh, several different uh, softwares that we use to make that as much automated as possible. So we're not having to do every stitch every time over and over again. So Prefab Logic's done a good job of being able to produce that. Uh, Audible has done a good job being able to produce that. And so it does take less time because of the systems that have been put in place and some of the repetitiveness of those systems. So, uh, yeah, the, the, there's some automation in that as well, as far as software writing is also. Love it. Pablo, thank you very much for the question and uh, in, in all your education. I love the one I see the PhD thing. All right. So let me ask you this, Rick. I don't know if you can answer it or not answer it. Cost per square foot by using automation. I don't know if you have a doubt in. Don't know if you even want to answer it just yet. What are you looking at as far as costs out the door? Uh, typically, as far as you can go to cost savings or you can do per square foot cost. Curious. You know, I can tell you that um, if you're, uh, I know that Audible, if we're building for the um, the uh, California market or the Bay Area market, I know from uh, my development partner that we're saving at least $100 a square foot, uh, which is a large sum. Uh, and I know that we're saving that because we've experienced it. Um, again, uh, our leading partner in Audible is a developer. And I can tell you that his first project uh, that he did with us years ago, back in 2004, I believe it was, uh, didn't go as smooth as he thought it would be uh, for either one of us. His second one was a little bit better. His third one was good and it's continued to progress. But again, you have to understand modular construction. You have to understand your manufacturer. And if you can get into a partnership between development and manufacturers and really understand that's where you have the cost savings benefit. $100 a square foot. Listen, if you're out there and that does not excite you, because that just excites me hearing it, uh, you know, and I know those are averages and you can't take it to the bank. 
I don't care if it's $25 a square foot or $50 a square foot. These are savings and not just in, in money, just not in your pocket, but time. Think about now, it. That's not including the time. The hundred dollars right. is just is just the cost of building. Uh, and then you have the time savings and time That's is right. money. Oh yeah, it's big money. When you actually take the cost of people on site, if you actually do the math on that, you'd be very surprised what a week, a day costs. All right, next question, Jennifer. And then we're gonna do a couple more and we gotta wrap it up. We've had Rick now for an hour and 13 minutes. Uh, Michael Cunningham, question, parametric, oh, okay, here we go. Will a change in one of one part of a module or modules be digitally updated and reflected in the adjoining modules? That's correct, yes. There you go. Perfect. All right. Hey, Julian Rossi. Hey, Julian. Question, LinkedIn. What does productization mean to you? And does Audible, you, Audible utilize this concept in their projects? Productization. Uh, I guess to me, and, and uh, I, I would be more standardized, best practices, standardized in materials, standardized in uh, as close as we can to match through standardization. So when I, when I look at that, um, it really is a benefit, uh, no matter what project you're building, to be able to repeat some of the uh, things that you're doing in that and make it as common as possible and as standard as possible. All right, love it, love it. Julian, Rossi, thank you so much for that question. All right, that's the last question, uh, Rick. We're gonna, we're gonna wrap this up, but I want everybody out there to know, uh, you know, what you shared with us today, Rick, is, is super, super important. There is cost savings. There are developers using this product and finding those cost savings. There is a ton of efficiency in automation. There's a ton of efficiency when using technology. And it's a great way to bring young people back into our industry. It's an amazing conversation. And, and, and I'm really happy to have you on the show today. Well, thank you, Dave. And we'll look forward to you coming and seeing us. We, we are going to come out there and everybody else out there, we're going to start defining this industry. We're going to know who we are and everybody that doesn't know who we are will easily be able to understand what is important to them, whether it's volumetric, modular, panelization, concrete, doesn't matter. We're going to start streamlining this conversation. We have a report coming out on June 1st, a report coming out on June 1st, where we're taking all of the information that we have brought together over this one year, six days a week, live streaming and we're going to bring that to you it's a it's an un, non-biased report or maybe it's biased towards us but this is what we see from our global conversation it is real people are saving money Offsite construction no matter how you want to spell it is the future you're mistaken if you think that doing it the same way we've been doing it year after year is the way to success because clearly it isn't or we wouldn't have a housing deficit like we do i don't know that's it rick what's the last thing for you one thing if you were to leave us, what is your one thing if you were to leave us personally or professionally? Uh, first of all, I'd say thank you again for sharing. Uh, it's always nice to be able to share what we're doing and and uh, we're open for people to share with us as well because we all learn each other. And I would tell you that in my mind and in my heart and in my vision, uh, we'll see modular construction become mainstream uh, and we'll see everyone benefit from that process. Perfect, I love it. All right. Thank you so much to you and uh, the team out of all. I love it. I can't wait to be out there in a few weeks. We are going to live stream and we're going to have a lot of fun doing it. We're going to continue this education by going to universities and other places throughout this country. Rick, you better save a full day for us, man. We're going to have a lot more questions once I get out there. Everybody else out there, thank you for tuning in with us today. And be sure to join us tomorrow on Increasing Influence. Also we have some special events happening. So look for our post there as well with Mark Bare Naked Willie and also BS Friday coming up 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Dave Cooper. Rick, thank you so much. Hang tight. We'll come back to you after the outro and everybody else out there. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye now. Thank you.